and he's going to tell us about the cool applications of GVFs in real life. Go for it, Michael. All right. So, um, yeah. So I am working in the uh, Blink Lab, which is bionic limbs for improved natural control, and um, working really closely with um, Dr. Patrick Pilarski, if you're familiar with his work. And we are an interdisciplinary lab um, with people working from medical backgrounds, science backgrounds, um, and engineering backgrounds. And um, yeah, one of the main motivations for this talk is um, we'd worked on this, this cool application of reinforcement learning um, for improving control of prosthetic limbs. And it had been a while, I think, since we presented it, anything on it. So I just want to you know, let people know where we're currently at and what we've done in the past and what we might want to do in the future. Uh, okay, cool. So just a quick overview here. I'm going to give um, a quick objective of what we're trying to accomplish, um, some background about what we've done in the past, some of our rebooted software, um, ideas for future studies, as well as ideas for other application areas besides prosthetics, and then some things we need to accomplish um, to get there. So the overall control of our lab is to improve control and performance of robotic prostheses. Um, we want um, persons of amputations to have better clinical outcomes and accomplish the activities of their daily life. So um, it is not so straightforward to control a robotic prosthesis. There's um, electrodes that are integrated into the socket. They typically just have one over a biceps, triceps, and um, there's you know, any number of functions that they have in the arm that they have to control using just these two signals. And um, that ends up being really complicated. Um, so what we wanted to do is see if we could apply reinforcement learning methods to um, improve over kind of what the state of the art is um, or what's conventionally used and which I'll uh, describe here with this video. Uh, so this is one of our research prostheses that we have in the arm. And um, this one has even more degrees of freedom than are commercially available. So when I say degrees of freedom, I mean different uh, joints that are moving on the arm. So we've got a few different wrist joints, an elbow joint, um, a hand joint. And um, in order to control these things, he's actually having to sequentially switch from one to the next. Um, he's doing that by just flicking his wrist over here. But what would normally be done on the prosthesis is he would have to fire his two um, electrodes at the same time giving like a co-contraction because um, normally you wouldn't want to have them required to use both hands just to switch one hand. You would want them to be able to do everything that they'd want to do with one hand um, just all in the same arm. So um, prosthetists, which are the clinicians which fit these kinds of devices to patients, tend to choose a small subset of movements rather than giving them all of these different things so they, you know, could control the arm in many different ways. They make it simpler because it's actually really difficult to manage this. Like how do they switch from one joint to the next? Um, and they wanna reduce the complexity and training time. So um, I don't have time to talk a lot about general value functions, um, but I think most people here are, are kind of familiar with them. I'll just give like a really quick rundown. We're, we're kind of using it as a prediction agent, which is one of the applications. So we have a signal of interest, for example, you know, when a joint might be active, and we're wanting to kind of uh, predict that using the general value function. So um, what we end up happening is once it sees a couple of examples and sees some patterns and movements, um, it can learn to anticipate um, when uh, uh, the movements might be happening in the future. So it, it's predicting at a certain time scale, usually a second or two into the future. Um, it can also um, predict when the joint is not going to be used as well. So um, what we decided to do, uh, look at this really great idea, we wanted to um, use the general value functions um, to predict which joint they would want to switch to next and then dynamically reorder that list um, in order to reduce the number of switches. Um, and so we call this technique adaptive switching. And we have kind of a, a video demo here, which hopefully works. Um, so on the left here, we have non-adaptive, 
where they're having to always switch sequentially from one to the next. Um, and then we have adaptive switching over here, where initially they also have to basically do the same thing. But even the kind of similarity be between grabbing one ball to the next, eventually it's able to learn to reorder the list in a way that um, it can they can get through the sequences much faster. And um, it's you know on on this adaptive trial, they're basically done here um, on the time bar. And then it takes twice as long for them to do it um, using uh, a fixed list. In, in this particular case, this is just one example. Um, sometimes it, the difference isn't that different, but in this case it was. Um, so just to kind of like go over how this might look in an actual sequence. Um, so say you were starting at shoulder joint and you wanted to switch the hand, you would have to do you know a couple switches to get there and then you want to go back to shoulder, so that's okay. It's only one switch, and then you want to go to wrist. That's another two switches, um, and then you want to go back to shoulder. That's another two switches. And each of these switches takes time and takes energy, especially if they're doing that co-contraction. Um, and it requires them to be thinking and constantly looking, or you know, staring at the hand to make sure they switch the right joint. There's also commonly errors where they might accidentally switch too far and then they have to go all the way around the uh, cycle again. Um, so it, it can be quite laborious to do this. Um, with adaptive switching, after you've shown it a few examples, kind of the sequence would look just like this, where um, you just, it, it will predict what you want to switch to and, and then you can switch to that one next. And you only have to just do four switches instead of seven switches or whatever it ended up being. Um, so that can provide like a pretty big improvement. Um, so just to highlight some of our, our past research in this area, we started in uh, 2012. And um, this was like me at three in the morning writing a data logger script for a patient that was coming in the next day and then it working and then giving the data to Patrick. And then he did his magic on it and was able to kind of post hoc um, with the offline data, see whether or not we would maybe get an improvement from this technique. Um, and, and the results, the initial results were really promising. Um, and then we brought on um, a master's student, Anna Edwards, to, to, to kind of like dig more into it. And so she started with an online experiment where we got it all working in real time on a system. And um, and we were using the old arms around there too. And we started off with a very simple task where it was just um, like move the shoulder over and like move the hand and then like move the shoulder over here and then like move the wrist and just repeating that over and over again, just to you know make sure it was working in the real time setting and, and it worked. And so then to follow up on that, um, we, um, tried on more able-bodied subjects and also more persons of amputations um, and transitioned to using the bento arm as well. And then we also did um, that simple task and um, uh, a box and blocks task, which was kind of what I showed you earlier. Um, this research was really well received. It was initially a conference publication and then um, it won best paper and was upgraded to a journal publication. Um, and then some follow-up work from that was kind of an extension of adaptive switching called autonomous switching, which instead of just answering the question of um, which joint might they want to use like in the next second or two, um, it was also answering the question, um, when um, will they maybe want to switch in the future in the next second or two? And then actually we're using that, um, uh, the signal from that um, GVF to, um, uh, trigger the the switching um, automatically so that they don't actually have to initiate the switch themselves. So just looking at some of the results here. Um, so the first iteration is pretty similar. I guess on this particular participant, it was trending to be slightly worse with adaptive switching. Um, in my practice, it just, when I use it and I've seen other people use it, it's, it's pretty similar um, between the two. Um, and then usually within an iteration or two, you find that you get um, significantly better performance with adaptive switching. So that includes the number of switches they're having to do to um, complete a task as well as the total time to complete a task. 
Um, so uh, it basically works um, similar or better in most situations. Um, I don't have the results to pull up for the autonomous switching paper, but what we found was um, sometimes it actually worked. Um, it would be much worse at first, and sometimes it would get better over time, and sometimes it would get worse. And I think what we kind of found in that study is that with the two agents, like you know the machine agent and the human agent, sometimes if they were like working well together, their performance would converge, um, but sometimes it would um, diverge. And what would happen is basically um, you have to make this like decision about when to start taking over um, the switching for them. And um, that was like a confusing thing for the user. And sometimes they didn't like that, the human user. And then also just generally, sometimes the human user would become impatient and they would switch themselves, but then the machine learning agent would also kind of switch at the same time and they would end up in the wrong joint. So um, that was, I think that there was some promise there, but there needs to be like a lot better communication between the two agents um, in order to make sure that it converges. Um, so yeah, um, that was like some of our results. Um, and then what kind of happened after that was um, some of the libraries that we'd used for the code were kind of um, deprecated, the student finished, the code base um, fell out of repair and wasn't running anymore. Um, but just last year, we, we wanted to kind of like pick it up again and start working on it. So um, we made a new framework uh, to um, create this like adaptive switching technique, which includes um, a few different things that I've represented in a block diagram here that I'll just quickly go through. So if you imagine it starting with the human user, they're using some sort of interface, um, like a, a muscle sensors on the residual limb, or they're using, we also use Xbox um, joysticks as kind of a, a proxy to those kinds of sensors. So they're either driving the, sending in drive signals into um, the software Brachioplexus, or they're sending in switching signals. And then Brachioplexus is handling all of that sequential switching and all the joint mapping. Um, and it's sending out joint commands, um, which are then coming back. Uh, feedback is coming back from the arm. So it's like it's state, it's observations. And then we're passing that to um, a Python script, um, which uh, has five different general value functions that are predicting each joint. Um, and so it's using this information as its state. And um, we're setting the cumulant equal to um, each joint, whether it's active or not. Um, these are some of the learning parameters here um, that we've used. Um, rep uh, the representation we typically use is tile coding. Also, we're also interested in exploring other ones. And um, kind of the learning algorithm we most commonly use is TD Lambda. Um, so, um, these uh, general value functions make their predictions, send them back to Brachioplexus, um, which then um, puts it into the switching list and dynamically reorders it. Um, one thing to note about kind of like how adaptive switching works is that um, you have to, um, once the user initiates a switching event, like they, they're done moving their hand and now they want to move their elbow, you have to actually freeze the switching list because um, you can get some kind of um, feedback loop where uh, if you allow it to switch, like dynamically reorder while they're trying to switch, like really weird things can happen. So we, we freeze the switching list and then we start it reordering again once they actually choose a joint and start moving it, that kind of triggers it to reorder. Yeah, so that's sort of the framework um, that we're using here. Um, that, we, that we've created. Um, I have like a not very great demo video of um, it working. Um, I don't actually have like a sec separate camera of the arm moving. I just have what's happening in the graphical user interface. So I'm just gonna kind of like skip ahead to here. So um, I've kind of like pre-trained um, the general value functions here with some movements and then enabled adaptive switching. 
these are the fixed switching order here that I was using before and I was having to do a bunch of different switches. And the main thing I just want to show here is now you can kind of see the switching list dynamically reordering itself. And these are actually the uh, um, prediction values that it's um, feeding back into the um, uh, Brachio plexus. Well, one thing to note that I didn't mention is the currently active joint needs to be set to be minus one, like a really low prediction so that um, like a really good prediction would be like, oh, you want to keep using the thing you're already using. So here's keep using that. But it would be annoying to always have to switch through the thing you're already using. So we, we put that right in the bottom. Yeah, I'm just going to, in the sake of time, I'm just going to continue on. Um, I, in the video, I had shown what happens if you try to retrain it. Um, and uh, that's actually going to motivate some of the future work is that it, it is kind of hard to, it's easier to train it the first time. It You only have to show it once or twice like an iteration of the task before it like does really well with giving you the thing you want. But if you try to retrain it, it takes like a lot of iterations. So in, in practice, it's actually easier to just reset the weights. Um, so anyways, I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so for future work, kind of what we want to do is we want to trial this uh, technique with more participants. So um, including both able-bodied and persons with amputations. And we want to transition from kind of like this desktop setup, which is really good for prototyping and testing to something that's more of a wearable platform. Some of the things that are really good on the desktop platform may be challenging to transfer to a wearable platform. For example, the shoulder position gives us a lot of information about what's happening with the task. But if someone's wearing the arm, they can rotate their whole body. And suddenly, you unless you have a body rotation sensor, they, the general value functions, the prediction agents, don't really know what's happening anymore. They don't know where, where the arm is in space. So um, we may need to add in additional sensors once we go to wearable system. Um, and we also, like that thing I talked about with um, learning a new task and maybe you've done really well on a task and you've trained it and you want to save that. So next time you can just like, you know, now I'm, you know, stirring spaghetti, but later I'm going to um, type on my keyboard or something. Uh, you might want to be able to have some way to like save those settings using some kind of interface. Um, and at first it could maybe be like a manual interface where you're like selecting tasks and you can save or overwrite them or something. Um, but what would be even better is if we could detect what task they were doing um, or what the context of their situation was automatically and then select you know, some kind of pre-trained or a blend of pre-trained weights to, to get them started with so they can learn faster. Um, and then uh, kind of the last thing, if everything's working kind of in the lab, the next step is to get it ready for like take-home trials. Um, and in order to do that, it has to be a fully wearable, battery-operated, uh, computationally, you know, restrained um, implementation of it. Um, so that is also something that we are interested in looking at in the future. So um, some other application areas that we're interested in is um, uh, grass pattern selection. So this is the handy hand that uh, Dylan designed in our lab. Um, and what would be great right now, it's sort of a similar thing if you want to select different grass patterns. You can't just like move your fingers. You can just do one type of grass pattern at a time. Um, but if you want to um, select them more naturally, it would be great if it could kind of you know detect what the situation was or the type of object you wanted to grasp and then um, you know predict which uh, which uh, grasp you want to use, and then you don't have to cycle as many times to get to the one you want. Um, same thing for hand exoskeletons, um, which are kind of fit over existing hands instead of um, missing limbs. Um, also interested in blending adaptive switching with other machine learning methods, um, such as uh, classifiers or regressors, to see if maybe you can get some advantages um, from both worlds if you, if, you, if you smush them together, just to give some idea, like, Within the kind of domain of prosthetic control, probably like 99% of the people use classifiers, and 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 you know 1% of the people use other machine learning methods, um, and we're probably the only group that uses reinforcement learning that we've encountered. Um, 
I'm also interested in maybe applying this to context sensitive menus. So you can imagine maybe like an application in a paint program or, or even in this program, I don't know if you can see my menu here, but in certain situations, you know, someone is probably likely to want to hit and show when they're at the last slide or something. And if it could dynamically reorder itself, so, you know, I'm not having to always constantly be um, switching through here and taking longer to get there, that would be better. Um, and then I think I'm just about out of time, so I'll skip ahead. Um, also, Animal Crossing could be improved with adapt adaptive switching. Just going to say that. Um, so we want to add in more things, including um, updating the learning code, which is in process, adding more sensors, haptic feedback. We want to release it open source so other researchers can become involved more easily. We also want are in the process of making a Unity version of the ARM, um, which uh, we're hoping to release for people that don't have access to a physical ARM. Just FYI, um, everyone in the RLAI potentially has access to a physical ARM if you want, but you can also once we get this Unity version, um, it'll have like object interactions and stuff, and you could use that as a sandbox as well. Um, yeah, and so I think I went a little bit over, but maybe that's OK. Um, so yeah, are there any questions? I have one, Rory. Mm -hmm. um, OK, first of all, Patrick, I think we should do this kind of stuff together in like exoskeletons for walking and do adaptive switching between gate types for like walking, sit, stand, stairs, curbs, all that kind of fun stuff. So let's. 100% agree. That sounds fantastic. I've been thinking about the same thing. So we, we should chat more. But that is a fantastic, cool. a fantastic application area, which is like very straightforward and very clear, but maybe challenging to do. So that's a great, great territory. Cool. Wait for me to get my own lab and then we'll do it together. Um, <laughs> but I, I just have a little practical question for you, Ori. For the adaptive switching, um, you know, I guess when, when a user's using the preset list, I mean, they, they get used to knowing what's next and they, they kind of just know. And then with adaptive switching, you know, aside from just figuring out what joint is moving, I guess, how do they figure out which joint got reordered, especially with the autonomous switching? So is there like a visual feedback where they're seeing what's next on the list now, or do they just kind of move and see what happens? And then do they have to adjust to that? Yeah, so this is something that's important is that, uh, so some of the other more conventional techniques, you can get by without giving any additional feedback to the user about what they've switched to. They'll just try switching and then look at it and see if it happens, but with the list reordering itself, you really need to, in addition to, you need to tell them that they've switched properly and that you need to tell them what they've switched to um, for it in order to work well. So it does require a little bit more um, feedback. The challenge with autonomous switching is we also needed to give feedback about when the auto automatic switching was going to be starting to happen. And we also needed to give feedback for like when it was going to automatically switch after that as well in order for it to um, work better. Um, so that's that's one thing that we're really interested in well in as well is like how do we integrate these different haptic feedback devices into the system and improve the communication between the machine and human agent um, to make sure that they dance well together. Any other questions? <laughs> I've got one, Rory. Um, so it, it seems sort of like we're trying to predict uh, user intent, right? Um, but a lot of what we're using for observations are very robot-centric, like what were you, where the servo positions and things like that. Um, what are your thoughts on adding more you know, human-centric uh, observations, like maybe EMG or EEG or things like that? Yeah, so that's interesting. In our earlier studies, we did include EMG, um, like muscle sensor um, feedback into the um, state space of the general value functions. But then um, we found in the later cases that it wasn't really necessary and it added, you know, like more dimensions, more computation. Um, but once we want to generalize to like a, a less controlled environment where we're really like defining the task and things like that, I think we need to be more creative with the type of information that we're providing to the prediction agents 
in order to get good performance. So we have had some talk about, um, and I think even some, some, uh, uh, some of the members of the RLAI have worked on things like um, taking information from cameras that are pointing at people's faces to get an idea of, you know, whether the machine agent is meeting their expectations or not and, and their confidence in it. Um, the EEG, the, the brain one is interesting because there are some people that are able to extract things like confidence out of it. Um, uh, but it remains to be seen how easy it is to get that working in a totally portable setup, which is our eventual goal. Um, we are talking a lot about also like to deal with that issue about like the rotation of the arm, adding in additional um, rotation and inertial measurement units to, to be able to measure that better. Um, some people have also talked about having like voice commands or voice feedback. You could say like, bad arm or good arm or, or whatever. So I, I think we really do need to explore that more in the future in order to make this this work in a more general way. Dylan, I just want to jump into the uh, the immediacy of the EMG signals with respect to the human the human motor intent is I think the interesting part there. So like the, the person wants to do something, their brain does some stuff, their nervous system does some stuff that activates some muscles, recruits some, some motor units in the muscles, and then we can detect that. Um, and then the other things all come downstream from that. So they're they're related, but they're separated in time. And so maybe one of the advantages we found of using the EMG, or whether the utility of the EMG uh, was that it came earlier. And so predictions could be, the predictions would rise well in advance of the event. And well, the advance, well in advance might be in the order of like a fraction of a second, but that's still enough for the, for the adaptive switching in some cases. Um, so I think it's partly getting closer to human motor intent in terms of the raw signals. It's also partly getting closer to the moment when the person was hoping to uh, begin to execute a motion. And that of course relates to the, the speed with which the machine can execute the motion as well. So, so there's, there's a temporal aspect and also a, a immediacy to the human decision-making mechanics that, that are both being taken into account. So I think, I think your question is even deeper in that respect and that it does require, we, we think hard about, both the timing of human intent and also the way that we can sample that intent in a way that we can execute upon that timing. Plus cameras are like good. And so having a camera in the hand of your prosthesis is clearly good. Just saying. I can't remember if I played this video, so I'll play it again. Any more, any more questions? Yeah, uh, I have one. So yeah, this looks really cool. Uh, could you tell us some more about uh, what exactly the GVS looks like? In the sense, like what are they predicting? And um, yeah, how exactly uh, does that, do, do, do those predictions help in your reordering the lists? Um, yeah, so maybe if I go back to this one. Um, so we have a signal that's coming from the arm um, that's saying whether or not it's moving or not. And so that's what the, the cumulant is. Um, so there's, uh, and then we have one for each joint. And so basically it's giving back a prediction about, you know, in the next second or two, does it think this joint is going to be moving? And, and then what we do is we just take all of them and they have some sort of like numerical value and we sort them. And so the ones that have higher values are the ones where like, oh, okay, this is, you know, higher probability to happen in the future. And then we reorder the list to put those ones uh, more preferentially near um, where they're going to be switching next. Um, right. And then you said that uh, uh, there was some kind of retraining that you did maybe with some hard coded motions of the hand so that um, so that the uh, value functions have some reasonable values before you fine tune them on the actual uh, patients. Um, so you can do that. Um, you can pre-train. Or the nice thing about um, this method is you can also kind of train on the fly. Um, it works best with like having everything starting at zero for weights, but um, it. it like surprisingly, like the, the predictions are initially really, really bad, but 
like after one example of an entire sequence, it typically like gives you the correct thing every single time. Now, if you have variation in how you execute a task, it's going to take longer because it's going to have to learn that variation. Um, but in, in practice, it, it, it works quite well. And um, one of the huge advantages of this method compared to all the other methods, like the classifiers, um, they're all kind of learning um, you know, this fixed set of examples. And then training is fixed. Um, and it can't learn continuously, whereas uh, the, the adaptive switching is one of the only methods applied to prosthetics that can actually learn all the time through interaction with the, the human user. Sounds good. Thanks. Can you help me understand how does user intent get input into the system at any point during before, like in training or in use? Yeah. Um, so basically, um, the user is kind of they know what they want to do with the task, and um, that signal like is kind of indirectly which joint is active. Uh, in different parts of the space. And that's kind of what we're feeding into the um, the prediction agents. So they don't have like a direct, direct signal into the user's intent, but they have sort of like an implied or indirect signal. Um, and kind of inherently, like if, if uh, it's making like a prediction, oh, you're going to want to do this thing next, and then you don't do it, it doesn't get reinforced, and the prediction will decrease. So if you get into that situation again, um, that item might not be at the top of the list anymore. It might be further down. OK, when you say the, the, user, the user doesn't do it, what is it that the user would do, like switching the, switching the joint? Yeah, so, they, like if... so say, say they're at shoulder, and they, the next in the reordered list thing is like hand, but they actually want to use wrist and they switch past hand and they go to wrist instead. Um, then the the wrist, the next time that it gets into that state, it's probably going to be ordered lower because um, it, the the movement wasn't reinforced by them actually driving it afterwards. So it's trying to imitate the user's uh, joint selection. Is that what it's doing? Yes. Yeah. Well, sort of. I see Patrick kind of wiggling his head in a in a in a way, but um, yeah, it's not imitating. It's 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 predicting what they want to do in the future. But why why are we talking about lists and ordering? Is that because we only have a one bit input to switch to the next item, and we if we had a, a larger bandwidth, then we wouldn't have to worry about switching one at a time, which seems like a very awkward way to, to give information to your pr prosthesis. Yeah, that, that is exactly it. We are limited to that one bit um, switching. And, and um, it's, it's sort of an inherent problem in prosthetics because the higher the amputation level goes, the less muscles you have to control more things on a robotic prosthesis. And so it's a, it's a huge limitation. And it's not just in prosthesis. It's in all kinds of assistive devices where um, they only can control like a very limited thing. It's often a list that they have to kind of cycle through. Sometimes you can cycle both ways through the list. Sometimes it's um, you know something like a context sensitive menu where you can you can go anywhere in the list, but um, there can be like a huge cost with selecting the item. And so that's what we're trying to do with adaptive switching is reduce that cost. It would be best if you could just like control everything directly, but um, we're not quite there yet. Any any other questions? See it. Check the chat. I mean, hands are the hardest to replace because there's so many, there's so much detailed behavior in the hand, right? Like it seems like if I wanted to control a hand, the best thing to do would have be use another hand in a in a glove, and that that, is... that that's not going to help us in this case, right? But we do we do have ten toes that we don't use for much. So if we had like a toe glove that could work our hand, 
we would have like a very a very high fidelity interface. Like this one bit thing is is a ridiculous. Seems like an absolutely ridiculous straw to try to drink through for this for the highest bandwidth organ that we uh, limb that we or whatever you call this appendage that we have to try to control it with one bit is seems like an absolutely hopeless task. No matter how good the value functions are, I, I don't I don't see how this could ever work. Yeah, I mean, I agree. It's a huge limitation, but for some people, it's a choice of having an arm or, or no, no arm. Um, the, the, there have been some people that have tried foot interfaces, and they were widely rejected um, because it required them to have to stand still while they were using the foot interface. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's a major area that, that we're hoping to improve on for sure. I'm going to I'm going to have to stand uh, adaptive switching for a moment, though, because like, I don't know what you mean when you say I can't see how it could possibly work because there's like the definition implicitly of what working means within that context. Right. Um, and in this case, working in part means we've got a better interface from like a participatory design standpoint and from a machine learning standpoint than the existing interfaces. Like that is a success from a development, especially like an applied development. Um, and clearly like adaptive switching is still very preliminary in a lot of ways in terms of applications, but it is clearly superior in a lot of ways to typical classification based systems. Um, and so in that sense, it has worked, right? You can't say that it hasn't worked if you're achieving better outcomes for the metrics that people care about in my electric <laughs> control systems. Akiko. <laughs> well, Rory, one thing that I think you mentioned really briefly, maybe, is that um, couldn't we sort of like steal a uh, a bit of what people do with classifiers, which is, which is essentially like throw many electrodes on instead of, instead of like just just one per muscle group. Could you could you like talk more about that? Like, do you think that um, that is something that would like give more input information? Yeah, like I, I think um, the idea of kind of like. So the, the way the classifiers work is that there's kind of a training calibration sequence. And um, also, yeah, feel free to leave if you guys got to go. Um, but uh, I'll stick around if there's more questions. Um, yeah, you have to give it kind of this fixed training sequence being like, oh, this pattern of muscles is my hand and this pattern of muscles is my wrist. Um, and it, it works OK, um, but it, it's also sequential control. Um, in, in fact, it works kind of similarly to autonomous switching. So it switches for you. Um, you don't always get the um, class output that you wanted. And what happens then is the hand starts moving like, you know, away from your cup or whatever. And you're like, oh, no. And you just like relax. And then you kind of fiddle with your signals until it starts, you know, moving the way you want it to again. And then, um, uh, and if, if the signals get bad enough and, and your control gets bad enough, then you have to hit a button and retrain it. Um, so it can get like pretty good performance. Um, like I, it didn't have some of the problems of autonomous switching. Um, and it, it did require way more sensors um, in order to get good signals. Um, but I think one of the things that was lost was that ability to kind of learn from the interactions of the human with their arm. It yeah, can only sorry. learn during that training sequence. Yeah, sorry, that's sort of what I meant. So like in the in what we've done with adaptive switching, we've just put on like enough electrodes to do direct control, like one per muscle group. Could but could we like steal that part of pattern recognition? Like put on a ton of electrodes but then like use reinforcement learning. Oh yeah, totally. We should do that. <laughs> like, do you think because like pattern recognition is obviously able to detect to use that much information to get out more than two pieces of of 
of like information. So do you think like re do you think that would work with reinforcement learning? Like here's a yeah, there, there are approximately an infinite ways of kind of like blending reinforcement learning with the more traditional pattern classification techniques that I think would be really, if, if we pick some of the most promising looking ones that we could, we could maybe do even better than just the classifiers or just adaptive switching on their own. And can I just add, I think RL would be much better to handle the variability you would see with several EMG placements. Just because, you know, if you have a lot of EMG sensors along a limb with traditional classifiers, they're really prone to getting stuck with the data it's seen before. And EMG signals vary quite a bit with different placement, even if you try to get it as exact as you did before. Um, also, just with like skin impedance and stuff. So classifiers are really prone to error just based on the the noisiness and the, the inconsistencies you get with EMG signals. But reinforcement learning would be able to adapt to that quicker and on the fly instead of, you know, having to go through a whole retraining set. So like, why haven't we done it yet? I, 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 I've refactored the code. Now we can do it. Let's do it. <laughs> so what about uh, representations? So one of the things that has been kind of a, a sadness for the adaptive switching project is the tile coding and feature construction that's done. Uh, yeah, so this is selective Kinerva coding. Yeah, we can we can we can enjoy that one. Uh, like, and, and so this was kind of alluded to with the suggestion that we add EEG or EMG data into the pot and see what happens. But it seems like uh, the greatest limitation right now is that you're basically binning up the servo motor space. You're binning up uh, the sensors and the actuators and then doing like pattern matching over it. And it doesn't necessarily leave the richness of representation for things like closer to user intent, let's say, to get back to something that people were talking about before. Um, and so while it might be good for the clinical trial tasks that people use, it may not necessarily generalize past that. I don't know what your thoughts are or what people's thoughts are there, not to like put it all on Rory. Like how do we, how do we make the, the learning both scalable and like embeddable, but at the same time, a little bit more robust to the complexity of the environment. Yeah, I, I think exploring different types of representation would be useful. Um, I didn't really talk about it too much, but some of the other ones we wanted to try were selective Kinerva coding. Um, maybe maybe neural networks, maybe. Um, <laughs> and one thing we didn't talk about is like, so, so it, it actually takes quite a bit of work to figure out a tiling that works well and to scale all the data. So to actually make something that, like this work, you need like a special kind of like engineer person that, that makes it work with the application and understands how to tune the representation and how to tune the learning and, and things like that. So to actually make it like practical in the long term across um, e even in this application across many people, but thinking about all those other you know application areas that we talked about um, in different you know video games or assistive software or um, uh, lower limb exoskeletons and stuff like that, there needs to be some better way to select all of these different parameters and what's the best representation and how do we move stuff up. The nice thing about Kinerva coding is some of that is, I mean, there's still some knobs to tune, but they're they're like maybe easier to tune. Um, so if we can move in that direction more, I think that will help make these uh, techniques more practical. Has any has anyone looked at adaptive tile coders? So that that's a thing that exists um, dating back like what, to the early 2000s or something, people were were into adaptive tile coders. Um, and that, like, it's basically making some small changes to the existing system. That could be an easy win for you. I don't know if you've thought about it. Yeah, it is something that I think uh, 
I thought about, and I, I think we should try some of those things. Please, please send me papers. <laughs> Any more questions? So the control is happening at like a per joint resolution right now. Is that is that how the person's controlling? Is it yeah, per one joint best, at a time. The best analog is to imagine using. Um, like a, you you have a single axis on a joystick, that's representative of their muscle signals. So this, if I move it up, would be like their biceps. This, if I move it down, would be like their triceps. And then if you fired both at the same time, that would be like their switching signal. Um, that's that's all they have. So it's an, it's an analog signal. And often it's challenging. Like these move completely independently on along this single axis. But that, that switching signal where they co-contract, they often don't have really good control of that. So sometimes they accidentally co-contract also. The signals fire at the same time. Um, so did that kind of bit, a, so pardon me? It's two bits of information they can send at once. Yeah, that, that's, that's all we have right now. There are um, surgeries where we can get more information. Um, but they're, they're invasive surgeries. There's also implants that you can use where you can get more selective information from the different nerves or muscles. Um, but that's also invasive and um, there's not really like a really good persistent implant yet that I know of that lasts for like a long term that would be appropriate for clinical impl implementation. Um, so th this is kind of what we're what we're stuck with right now as the interface. And this is like this is actually pretty good in terms of rehabilitation. There are some interfaces where all they literally get is like the click on the the joystick or like pressing a button, and that is their only input into the system. And um, that's that's even more challenging to try to deal with. So, but what would be the ideal here? Like, ideally, we wouldn't be controlling one joint at a time, right? Like, when I go to get a cup, I kind of think about where my whole arm structure, how it should, like, I don't think about individual joints, right? I think, oh, I want to go there. And yeah. and then and then there's some control system underneath that that I don't have to think about, like my lizard brain, I think, that's moving all the subjoints. And, and what, what I'm really conveying to my limb is just a general intent. So I, I understand that the tech is, is far from that right now, but is that the ultimate direction to have some kind of um, much higher dimensional intent that just goes zip and then you can offload to a control system to actually do the moving? Is that, is that kind of yeah, a Yeah, that, is, that is the long-term goal. So instead of being sequential, it's multi-joint. You can move everything simultaneously and you can move multiple things. Um, there are some people that study like um, this idea of like, whether we want to be able to really control things joint by joint and think about our individual joint angles or whether it's like more like you're saying where we just have like a target idea or intent and then we just want it to be there and do the thing. Um, so um, I think there there is some potential there as well. Um, and that um, I think there's some uh, proposed interfaces where you use like something like eye tracking and you like look at something and and then you like select it and then it, your arm could just like go there. Um, some people have like maybe investigated that, I think. Um, but there's a lot of um, machine vision challenges with that um, that are really, really difficult. And um, also there's a lot of like robotics and mathematical challenges. So even just like doing that inverse kinematics to be like, I want to go there and assume it's like the right object and we detect it correctly. Like the demonstration I saw on like running on a laptop, it was taking two minutes to figure out a path if it had obstacles. And I was like, oh, if you got to grab something and it takes two minutes, it's that's a long time to wait. That's what that's, RL should help with that, right? Robotics RL should help with that part. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I am interested in and eventually moving in that direction. Um, but uh, our group is also kind of like, we're 
thinking about the big picture as well, but we're also thinking about like the short term, like what could we get working that improves things, you know, incrementally for what people have available to them right now and not that's going to be like 10 years from now. I think a lot of those types of interfaces might also be improved once the implants become um, more reliable as well and we have better control information. Yeah, it's just really hard to do endpoint control like that unless you have like, I don't know, your entire house motion captured or like a really, a really good understanding of where your end effector is in space. <laughs> so yeah, like Patrick said, it works well in the lab. Hey Rory, um, so I have like, maybe this is a naive question, but I'm thinking about this thing about the limited amount of information you have. Mm -hmm. You're kind of using these time sort of RL uh, methods on sort of the control side, right on the output side. And I'm thinking about what you can do on the input side, right? So just like a simple example, if you've got like, you double click a mouse, you're conveying more information, but the cognitive load is not twice as much as single clicking, right? So mm -hmm. by sort of temporarily extending the input side, you're getting more bits of information, but maybe that's not like so hard on the user, right? Maybe because there could be like gestures they can do that are like really easy to just kind of learn how to do, right? Uh, so I'm wondering if the RL stuff you're using right now allows that sort of thing to happen naturally. Like, is it possible for the user to train the system to respond to like sequences that they just can kind of do without thinking? Um, it, it is possible. Um, we've explored a little bit with having them be able to control things with patterns and demonstrate their movements and things, but we haven't explored it too much. The thing about like um, the double clicking is like a pretty interesting idea and, and it is used to some extent. Um, I sort of simplified what was conventional control yeah. a little bit. There are like schemes that are a little more complicated where they have like multiple lists that they can switch through and they use like single clicking to go through one list, but then they use double clicking to go through the other list or something like that. Um, I do think that reinforcement learning could help with that um, to better be able to nuance out some of those patterns if you wanted to try to leverage that kind of, um, uh, those kinds of signals. Um, the challenge is, is that sometimes it, it ends up becoming less intuitive for the user to learn all of these tricks and hacks and to understand all these, you know, branching menus and stuff like that. Um, and, and to keep track of all these different types of signals. So I, I think there's some potential there. Um, right, so that's why I was thinking like a learning system might make it slightly easier because, because right now you're kind of thinking of there's like some sort of menu system, right? And you're splitting it into two parts, right? That one, there's an input, which is how do you select the thing in the menu? And then the second part is how do you construct the menu? Um, but if you like, like maybe some sort of more end-to-end -end system could help with that, right? I guess the problem with that is that you run into this issue of not being able to train from normal switching kinds of tasks, right? You need like a special training process that's just on the end-to-end -end system. Um, so I guess the challenge is how to get people to actually put the time to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, we tried in some of our early works doing kind of an end-to-end -end system where we um, just kind of had the arm doing like a random walk. And if it kind of randomly walked in the direction that you wanted, you could give it like a little right. pat on the back. Right. And um, like stuff like it, it worked, but mm -hmm. it also was incredibly like laborious to train. Right. And, and we also had trouble with the random walks uh, destroying our robots. Um, right. <laughs> turns out randomly walking really slowly is really bad for robots. Yeah, so as a theorist, I'm just going to listen to the bit about that that says that we need more sample efficient reinforcement learning because things are way harder when you've got a real person than Atari or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Any more questions? Did everyone get their questions in? Looks like we're starting to get a, an exodus. 
Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. All right. You guys stayed for a really long time. So you're going to get a bad joke that I'm just going to make up on the spot. Um, okay, here's the here's the bad joke. Have you ever had orange juice? Why do they call it orange juice? It's like pretty much yellow. <laughs> Isn't it more yellow? It's kind of more yellow than orange. Let's be honest. <laughs> That's that's as bad as it gets. Um, so thanks, guys. <laughs> Please get out of the pool. Nice, nice. <laughs> All right. Thanks, you guys, for your attention. And uh, looking forward to more tea time shenanigans in the future. Yep, thank you so much, Rody. Thanks, Roy. That was great. Right, cheers. <laughs>